Hello, good evening all and good day to everyone. And thank you so much already for joining us tonight. It's good to be uh, back here with us and I hope you had a wonderful weekend and are ready to learn a bit more tonight about endometriosis. And we do have a very special guest with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Andrea Vidali is with us. So how are you feeling, Dr. Vidali, today? Good evening, Carolina. Uh, good evening, I guess, good afternoon, wherever you are uh, in the world today. Uh, feeling fantastic. We were just troubleshooting our interface. I hope I just figured out how to use it. So I hope I don't make any mistakes, but it looks pretty straightforward. Yeah, I, if, I guess I've spent the last year pretty much 50% uh, of my time on the Zoom call. So I should right. know how to use these interfaces a little bit. Yes, definitely. Uh, we are kind of used to all those um, new platforms, etc. nowadays, but I'm um, sure it's going to go great. And of course, if you need anything, I am right here. So don't worry. Okay. Um, I'm your host, Caroline, as always. And I just want to mention that you probably know that March is uh, endometriosis. It's the month of endometriosis, actually. So um, as you know, uh, we do want to uh, encourage you to, to ask your questions. We do want you to learn a bit more from all fertility experts. But also, I just want to mention that, as you know, we are here every single day to support you, to educate you, but also to simply help you out as much as we can. And as you know, my IVF is the is a part of European Fertility Society. And we are very, very proud to be able to, to connect today with uh, Dr. Andrea Vidali as well. As well. And very, very um, excited that uh, you are our presenter, okay? And uh, as always, okay, we will start with uh, Dr. Vidali's presentation. And of course, afterwards, it will be time for your questions. So if you have any, go ahead, type this in. We will uh, then show all those questions and Dr. Vidali will uh, answer them for you one by one as well. Okay, and um, that will be it from me, Dr. Vidal, you yeah. ready, right? Well, yeah, first of all, a shout out to the European mm -hmm. Fertility Society. Uh, as uh, you may not know this, but you know, just from my accent, I am European, I'm Italian. So although most of my career has been in the United States, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, who I am. Uh, like my name is Andrea Vidali, like I said earlier, and uh, I am, I wear multiple hats. I wear many hats. I am a, a reproductive surgeon, a robotic surgeon, and I uh, perform quite a bit of endometriosis surgery, mostly robotic surgery here in New York City. That's where I am. Uh, but I also have training in, uh, in reproductive endocrinologists. Uh, I have, I'm a fellowship trained reproductive endocrinologist. I trained at Columbia. And um, I'm also a reproductive immunologist, uh, which is the science that deals with the, the immunology of reproduction. It's, it's not a new field, believe it or not. It's been around for a very long time. But for some reason, some people think it's still controversial when you know there's a journal of reproductive immunology. So it's like a very, very broad field. Uh, but unfortunately, there's not as many people who actually are practicing reproductive immunology, uh, especially, uh, you know, anywhere, I would say. There aren't that many in the United St States. There aren't that many in Europe either. So it's certainly uh, a field that would benefit from more providers. Um, so today, the topic that uh, we're going to be discussing is a little bit at the crossroads of uh, what I think is... These, the three major topics, endometriosis, um, infertility, fertility-related problems, and immunology as well. And we'll try to cover all of them. I have, uh, last week, uh, I'm part, I'm a co-founder of a fantastic or organization, which is called the Endometriosis Summit, um, www.theendometriosissummit.com, which is an organization which is focused at putting together uh, patients and practitioners uh, for what pertains to endometriosis as it pertains to both fertility and pain and also reproductive immunology. We also we have a reproductive immunology summit and we have a uh, and we have a, um, a an endometriosis summit. <laughs> How could I forget that? Sally Sorrell is going to kill me. My my partner in crime, Dr. Sally Sorrell, who is a physical therapist, has a doctor in physical therapy. 
and an endometriosis expert. Uh, so we have this organization and, and we've been sort of spreading the world over all the, uh, these years. And uh, the presentation that I'm about to use as a guide is something, uh, parts of something I presented there at the summit. And uh, so I want to start with that first. We'll use it as a guide and you're going to have, um, I see questions coming in already. So we're going to, I'm going to move quickly through the presentation just to frame the discourse. And then uh, we'll take questions. I'm sure there's going to be plenty. Uh, I do a lot of these things, so I know that a lot of questions come in. Try to keep your questions a little bit general. Uh, sometimes it's harder. People say, "Oh, I have this problem, I have that problem." It's a little harder to address specific questions, but I will try to. I'll try to be as helpful as I can. Um, and uh, one last thing, I am endometriosis underscore surgeon on Instagram. Uh, and you can also find me on Facebook. So please follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, so we can move on now with my presentation. Um, Carolina, oh yeah, I'm, I'm here. Okay, we, here you go. Carolina's already already uh, hit it. So I think that one of the issues that um, the big problem that we have when it comes to endometriosis and reproductive and e reproduction is that there's very poor research. And the reason why the research is not that great is because surgeons do not publish a lot of papers. They just are busy doing surgeries. They're like manual workers. Uh, they're, I'm not saying they're not intellectual. They just are busy people all day long. And I think they don't, they don't write a lot of papers. Um, there's another problem, which is the current problem about endometriosis. The second dilemma is that IVF doctors do not, quote unquote, believe that endometriosis uh, is associated with infertility or causes infertility. Or maybe if they do believe it, they believe that IVF will bypass the problem. So if you've had IVF of your, you know, you're dealing with IVF and you have endometriosis, the doctor will often tell you, oh, don't worry, IVF will bypass the problem. Okay. And, uh, and the third problem is that there aren't really any good protocols that address endometriosis adequately. So even if there's a, a desire to address the problem, there's no clarity on how to actually address the problem, which is certainly a factor. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to address very quickly a few questions, which, and then I'm going to answer them. The first one is that does, that, does endometriosis affect IVF outcome and how? Um, how should we screen for endometriosis? Um, how should we treat endometriosis within the context of fertility and IVF? And, uh, you know, what about endometriomas and the concerns about treating endometriomas? You know, these are the big questions, I think. Um, now, uh, when it comes to the first question, does endometriosis affect uh, uh, um, uh, uh, outcome of IVF? There's no, and how? There is no question that uh, we know the we know an answer to the, to this question. You know, there's no question we don't answer the question. Look at this, war, it's called it's what we call the word salad. A word salad. Uh, there's no question that uh, endometriosis affect egg quality. It's a fact, and that's probably probably the main reason. And I I I'm a clinical doctor, so today I was talking to patients earlier today, and we had the same conversation, which is that endometriosis affects egg quality. And the way it does affect that quality is probably by affecting somehow steroidogenesis. We do know that uh, there is alterations in um, uh, cytochrome, pro cytochrome P450 and lower estrogen levels, both intrafollicular and also when people do IVF cycles. This results in effects at the, at the level of the, of the egg cell at multiple levels. Uh, this image that you see, you can see that there's reduced mitochondrial uh, level. Uh, there's actually a test to check for mitochondrial DNA content. It's called mitograde, um, and we've been using that test. You can see dark granulation uh, in the egg, and sometimes patients with endometriosis are, are told, oh, you have dark eggs, and there's a thinking that the eggs are dark because of the chocolate. That's not the reason. It's, a, it's because of what's happening in the cell, Okay. And uh, and the hardening of the zona pellucida, which is that that sh that uh, skin around the egg, which gets hardened and so harder to penetrate. So there's plenty of data on that in IVF, which is you know I think it's quite solid data. And um, 
uh, Carolina, let me ask you a question. Is there a timer here? Like, I'm not keeping track of time, so I don't see it anywhere uh, in the app. Keep an eye on that. It's like 12 past, uh, well, 8 p.m. for okay, us. I don't see the time. You should have a timer here so people know. It's a good thing, but I'm afraid we do not have it. So Yeah, okay, good, good. Yes, so, okay, I'm going to keep my clock here. Uh, so the second part, um, and so we have plenty of data in IVF on this. Uh, and it's quite, um, I think, quite clear that patients with IVF have less oocytes, lower estrogen levels, and less mature oocytes. So it's a fact. When it comes to implantation, and, you know, let's agree, you know, implantation meaning, you know, the embryo does not implant. You know, you get your embryos, you get your embryos, you get these beautiful embryos, or you know, more or less beautiful embryos. You got, oh, I see Dr. Sally Sorrell is in the room, which is a you know, welcome, Sally. How are you, Dr. Sorrell? Uh, and uh, you have your, um, your embryos and they're tested, maybe PGS tested, you do your transfer, no pregnancy, no implantation. Um, and uh, is, how is this affected? How, and you're asking the question, how, does endometriosis affect that? Uh, there's some there is some evidence that um, there are endometrial alterations that are due to endometriosis, most likely to some degree of progesterone resistance, and uh, this is also delayed, probably related to uh, the problems that also happen at the level of the egg. Uh, so it's a similar problem, and uh, this progesterone resistant probably disrupts implantation to some degree. Uh, and there's also the inflammatory immunological element, which we have. I have a separate video that I will play in a minute, but we'll discuss with it in a second. Okay. So, and uh, many IVF doctors, um, especially European IVF doctors, uh, especially Spanish doctors from Spain, will tell you that endometriosis does not affect implantation. Uh, and this is uh, the result of uh, uh, at least one or two, you know, studies which looked at uh, what are called sibling uh, egg donor oocytes, where they took eggs, egg donor eggs from the same donor and gave them to two separate recipients. They fertilized them, of course, and, and then they compared that one recipient had endometriosis, the other did not, and they looked at outcomes. And at least in the Spanish papers, there was no difference. But then at the same time, there's like a Greek paper from uh, the group out in Thessaloniki, Dr. Um, uh, Doctor, um, uh, oh my God, he's such a great guy. Um, uh, he'll come to my mind, I apologize. Uh, but anyway, the group over there, uh, that um, also re revealed the opposite, which was, you know, that there was an effect. So I think the verdict is not out, but I think you'll get different opinions on that from different doctors when it comes from that. Um, obviously, whenever you do these studies, nothing is ever going to be exactly the same, right? Because there's still a sperm component. So that's kind of like a different... Uh, Dr. Prapas, Dr. Nikos Prapas from Thessaloniki, excellent doctor. Um now, uh, endometriosis, when you look at uh, the curve, the curve that you see in this picture, in this image, is from, uh, is from SART, from SART, which is the American Association of Fertility Clinics. And the you can see the, cord, the curve has a downward slope. The reason why the curve has a downward slope is that it shows that endometriosis is less and less diagnosed in IVF cycles, you know, uh, IVF clinics report their results to IVF to SART every year, and uh, they report their data. And uh, as part of the reporting, diagnosis is included. And they have different diagnoses. They have a male factor, tubal factor, egg factor, endometriosis, unexplained. Of course, and this is like a side note, but since this is some sort of a Joyce and stream of consciousness I'm doing here since I'm alone here in front of a camera, I have to say that uh, I hate unexplained as a diagnosis, okay? Because in my mind, unexplained means that the doctor hasn't dug deep enough. 
unexplained is at this day and age should never really be a diagnosis, but believe it or not, it's a very common diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So endometriosis is going down as a diagnosis because nobody's looking for it, okay? Because laparoscopy has been eliminated as part of the diagnostic testing. And uh, and so like you just don't have you don't see it anymore as a diagnosis. That doesn't mean that it's not there. It's obviously there. It's just not diagnosed, which is kind of crazy, right? Um, uh, but you know the reality is that ultrasound is not adequate. Okay, ultrasound is not adequate in diagnosis endometriosis, and it's really a problem, which is that uh, if you don't if you don't do uh, be mostly because if you don't look enough for the problem, you're not going to find it. I always tell people, if you're not looking for the problem, you're not going to find it. And endometriosis sometimes can be hard to find. And the reason why, why it's hard to find is, for example, uh, individuals, patients do not report their problems, do not report their symptoms. They're, they, although they have pain and cramping, they always, they always, they're always told the pain is normal. So they're not going to report that. That pain with intercourse, they don't report it. And that's why it comes down to this whole idea of silent endometriosis, which, you know, probably doesn't even exist uh, because it's never really silent, but that's what we call it. Um, we're going to play a seven-minute video now on uh, silent endometriosis that I presented at the Endometriosis Summit. And uh, it's the audio is going to take over. As uh, many of you probably know, I wear, I wear two hats. hats. On, one On one side, side I, dedicate I dedicate a lot of my work, work in life to surgery. surgery. On, On the, the other side, side, I am a reproductive endocrinologist. And, and more, specifically, more specifically, I am a special, special type of reproductive endocrinologist. I'm a reproductive immunologist. immunologist. And uh, my, my focus, focus is, is on uh, reproductive, reproductive failure, failure as it relates to both infertility, miscarriage, and uh, with a special focus on endometriosis. And you may have seen some iterations of these slides before because both Dr. Braven and myself have given this lecture quite frequently, mostly because it's such a fascinating topic. Most of our patients in the reproductive immunology practice, which is separate from our pain practice, come to us with unexplained infertility, recurrent miscarriage, and or recurrent IVF implantation failure. They've done multiple IVF cycles unsuccessfully, and there is no explanations. What is interesting to know is that many of these patients when tested appropriately, either have autoimmune disease, diseases or we believe to be in the preclinical stage of autoimmune diseases. The basis of immune rejection is that the embryo is similar to a transplant, with half of the embryo coming from the father and foreign to the mother. The maternal immune system normally tolerates the embryo because of immune privilege in the pregnant uterus. But immune privilege can be disrupted by the presence of inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. Loss of immune privilege can lead to rejection of embryo, unexplained infertility, recurrent implantation failure in IVF, recurrent pregnancy loss, and complication of pregnancy, IUGR, preeclampsia, etc., etc. What is important to know is that endometriosis is associated with peritoneal inflammation and altered cellular and humoral immunity. Elevated levels of inflammatory cytokines and other inflammatory mediators in the peritoneal fluid and in the blood. alter levels and functional macrophages, natural killer cells, dendritic cells, and regulatory T cells. Alter B cell activity and production of autoantibodies, including antinuclear antibodies, ANAs, and anti-endometrial and anti-ovarian antibodies. It is likely that these alterations lead to both pain as well as reproductive failure. We also know that endometriosis is associated with autoimmune diseases. Endometriosis is associated with Hashimoto thyroiditis, lupus, antiphospholipid syndrome, scleroderma, Sjorgen syndrome. Autoimmune diseases are associated with various combinations of HLA alleles. And like 
autoimmune diseases, endometriosis is associated with particular alleles of HLA genes. And we are aware that certain HLA haplotypes that we find in endometriosis patients overlap with autoimmunity. So what it's interesting to know is that often we suspect endometriosis in patients who otherwise do not have the classic symptoms and signs of endometriosis. The pain, the menstrual cramps. In fact, we call this silent endometriosis. In reality, when actually we start asking the questions very deep, true, true silent endometriosis is relatively uncommon. These patients do have mild symptoms when the proper questions are asked. Nevertheless, they are mild enough that they do not affect everyday life. This is why we still call it silent. And it's not that silent because the main symptom is reproductive failure. And, uh, we have identified certain characteristic features, clinical indicators of endometriosis, a family history, physiological findings, which I will cover in my lecture on endometriosis and IVF, such as poor egg quality and reduced response to IVF, endocrine problems, ovarian failure, um, genetic findings, and of course, immunological findings that uh, we have put together in what we call an endometriosis immunological panel. This is basically what is uh, now known as uh, personalized medicine. And uh, over the years, we have developed uh, testing panels, which I think are very valuable in our database. And um, we are now developing a, a new panel that I think is going to be very valid. And it is a, an immunological assessment report that will help identify patients at risk and tailor treatment and also quantify based on the artificial intelligence uh, the chance of pregnancy loss with a prediction tool. Um, and this will help assist, it's helping us assist, uh, and it will help assist these uh, patients' physician in uh, tailor treatment of uh, reproductive failure, pregnancy loss, and also identify the presence of endometriosis. Obviously, whenever endometriosis is suspected, uh, laparoscopy should be considered because uh, surgical treatment combined with immunotherapy significantly improves fertility and pregnancy outcome in this at-risk patient population. I'm not going to dedicate much time about the surgical treatment because the rest of the panelists will be covering this topic extensively during the endometriosis summit today and uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, but I'm looking forward to questions from the audience and to a discussion with our fellow panelists. So we're back live. Uh, yes, we can switch to the presentation. Okay, perfect. Let's go ahead with it. Just a second. Yeah, where I was before. Yeah. So we talked about immunological testing. And look, we could have a whole session on reproductive immunology. Actually, um, I am working now with a new company that I founded, which is called Pregimmune, where we have developed a very sophisticated testing, which is also predictive and which will be launching very soon. So that's going to be amazing, just mind-blowing. And, and when we're ready to go, I will... We'll do another one here and we'll talk a lot about that. And I'm pl pl happy to take immune questions, but I think immunology plays a major role in this whole process because immunology, endometriosis is an inflammatory condition. And so the whole immune discourse uh, around uh, how those macrophages that are there present in immunology then migrate into the uterus and affect implantation ultimately. And, um, but you know, what other uh, non-invasive testings? And we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna talk about three things now, which I think are important. First of one, I'm gonna talk about BCL6 testing and the Receptiva test. I'm not sure if in Europe the Receptiva is available as a test in itself, but certainly BCL6 testing is uh, uh, normally done as a non-invasive test. And the whole idea is that uh, if you have elevation in BCL6, 
uh, this is associated with endometriosis. You know, my my thinking is the following, which is when you look at my data, patients who had either miscarriages or failed implantations, almost 80%, 73%, whatever, 70-something percent, I don't remember the exact number, above 70% had endometriosis. So why bother? You're just in a high-risk group. If you're failing, if you're not getting pregnant, you may have silent endometriosis. You should have a laparoscopy. Why, why even bother with the extra step? That's like the first uh, take-home point. Um, ERA, um, obviously endometrial receptivity test is extremely popular now. And it's kind of like the, uh, uh, the test, the go-to test that many IVF centers now use when you have failed cycles. Um, ERA does not correlate with endometriosis, so it doesn't really help with that. Um, I, you know, and, you know, there are issues with regards to ERA as far as I'm concerned. The majority of patients are pre-receptives. When, when people are, are non-receptive, they're mostly pre-receptive. And, um, and the correlation with endometrial biopsy is not there. So, I mean, I think there's questions, especially with ERA in, in patients who had multiple IVF fail cycles about the reliability and the actual ability to actually uh, uh, transform a failed cycle in a non-failed cycle. Uh, one thing we need to say, though, is that when it comes to endometriosis and IVF, medications to suppress endometriosis like hormones, they treat pain and not fertility. This idea that if you take birth control pills or Lupron, when you stop the birth control pills or the Lupron, you're going to be better because you suppress the endometriosis. That's not true. You just wait, you wasted three months, okay? Now, whether or not there is a reset of the endometrium and that may help implantation, it's a possibility, not very solid data, but it's there. And it's possible that if you're doing IVF, that a couple of months of Lupron or oral contraceptives or, or, or progestins will, you know, reset the endometrium. But otherwise, short of that, to do it just therapeutically, it's not going to help you, okay, if you're trying on your own. Um, now, uh, I'd like to say two more things that are very important. Is there an IVF stimulation protocol that is ideal for endometriosis? And the question is, uh, it's, a, it's a tough question because uh, there may be, but the protocol you're going to use to improve your egg retrieval may not help your implantation. So if you have endometriosis or you think you have endometriosis, you should probably consider doing an all free cycle, banking, and then a frozen embryo transfer later, which is pretty much what almost every IBS center does in the United States today anyway, with a few exceptions. So if you have endometriosis, do a protocol and probably a minimal stimulating protocol or an estrogen suppressing protocol that's going to focus on egg quality and then go for the frozen embryo transfer because those protocols are not good for implantation. And is there a good protocol for implantation for, F for frozen embryo transfer? The answer is that it's not sure. When you look at the data, it's kind of all over the place. So I think that's going to be kind of open for that. So I think it's more important probably uh, the egg production, the quality, and then less focus on the protocol for implantation. And if you did the ERA, follow the ERA. Um, we talk about suppression, uh, surgical excision. There's plenty of data that surgical excision may enhance implantation, but it's not extensive data, but we certainly encourage that. And um, the big concern about the endometriomas is that if you have an endometrioma, the doctor will say, well, you you take out the endometriosis, but you damage the ovary. That's like a big, big dilemma. We could do like a whole lecture on that, but I'm going to say that, which is the presence of an endometrioma per se already damages the ovary. There's pretty clear evidence that endometriosis affects both ed qual endometrioma, egg ed quality, and implantation. The key is how to perform the surgery and the patients who are who are better suited for this. And it's most likely that the younger patient will definitely benefit the most. The older patient has to be a little bit more careful. Nevertheless, uh, the key here is who performs the operation. 
And uh, but the idea that to leave to take out the endometriosis and leave the endometriomas inside not to damage the, ov- the ov- damage the ovary that should not it's not an acceptable question an acceptable issue. I think I've covered almost everything, um, and I've been talking for about thirty minutes. So I'm going to leave it open to some questions because otherwise we're going to be um, we're not going to have enough time um, uh, to discuss all of this. So right. let's go with questions. Go ahead. Perfect. Let's go ahead with the questions. Get a cup Thank of you coffee. So- yeah, sure, of course. Um, yeah, let's have a look at the very first question. As you can see, plenty of questions are right here. So let's have a look at this one. Two labs mm-hmm. previously. Um, I've had four chemical pregnancies, all IVF, doing ERA next month and hoping to transfer next PGS, normal embryo soon. Embryo symptoms are back. Advice on whether I should get another lab. Was advised to take the decapeptil. Don't want that. Don't want to take any chances with our P- uh, PGS normal embryos um well um it's it's a very loaded question because you have you have a number of issues here you have a history well these are kind of personal questions i would prefer more general question but i'm going to address this issue uh in a more general way okay uh the first issue is the two laparoscopies for excision which we as we have to assume that they were excision uh, and, you know, sometimes people call excision, but then they don't do it. So my advice for you would be to, if you have pictures, to review them with your doctor to make sure that it was indeed excision. Looks like the symptoms are coming back. So that's a factor. Now, four chemicals, that's like a big deal. Four chemicals on PGS normal embryos, that's really a, an issue. That's really a factor. So what I would tell you, my recommendation for you would seriously to consider uh, to be evaluated from an immunological standpoint. Um, I don't know if you've done that or if your doctor, quote unquote, believes in this, but with four PGS normal embryos implanted and no, and only biochemicals, uh, actually, anyway, four chemical pregnancies, two PGS normal, I would say that probably uh, that's like a factor. When it comes to decapeptyl, uh, I'm not sure that it would make a difference, the Lupron, because you, you implanted, but then you had the biochemical, right? So it's not like you did not implant. So it looks like it's beyond that. So I would probably say that something you need, and there's, like I said, decapeptyl or, or oral contraceptives do the same thing. You could do like two months of oral contraceptives, the same as Lupron, basically, for, for what pertains to this, the resetting of the lining, or agestin, norethindron acetate, 10 milligrams a day. Um, so, uh, I think that, um, that's sort of how I would do it, but I would consider certainly an immunological evaluation. All right. Thank you so much indeed for that very first uh, question. And of course, for your answer to that one and let's have a look. Okay. More questions are coming in. So, uh, let's have a look at and this And by the one. way, Dr. Sorrell, who's like really an endometriosis expert is answering some questions there as well mm-hmm. on the, okay. on the, on the, on what do you call that? On the on the 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 chat yep. yes perfect i do see that so i guess this one uh adenomyosis yes so what is the impact yes. of adenomyosis on fertility yeah adenomyosis is clearly associated with uh reduced implantation it's it's unquestionable and very clear uh doctors uh, underdiagnose adenomyosis they don't see it they don't look for it Sometimes it's clearly there and they don't see it. Sometimes they see it, but they ignore it. Uh, mostly because the answer, and it's a little bit like the answer of uh, the other individual earlier who said, oh, my doctor said that people with lupus have normal pregnancy. Not all of them. This is, it's like telling people, oh, I know somebody who smoked their whole life and never developed lung cancer. Not every smoker gets lung cancer. But if you smoke, you get a whatever many fold. I think it's like a 14 or 24 fold increase in the risk of lung cancer. So everything has to be looked in in in, uh, in uh, risk, not in terms of possible or impossible. Everything is possible. Everything is impossible. You know, or I guess everything is possible. Nothing is impossible. But the point being that you have to, whenever you have a failure, you have to look at your overall chance of success, and you have to say, all right. What are the factors that can affect my success? There may not be one factor. It could be a combination of factors. It could be like one factor is the endometriosis. One factor is the adenomyosis. 
One factor is that you have autoimmune conditions. One factor is that you have a thin lining and so on and so on. And you have to tackle each one of these factors. This is what we call personalized medicine. If you go to a doctor, a fertility doctor that has like one of those, you know, everybody's the same approach, cookie cutter, you know, you're not going to find your solution. Maybe you're lucky you get pregnant on the first shot. But once you start failing, you need to start breaking it down and look at all the different factors. And that's what you need to do. So adenomyosis certainly plays a role. And uh, I mean, I think that on adenomyosis, there's pretty su substantial data that, number one, you got to do a frozen embryo transfer. You can't do a transfer on a fresh transfer. You're just not going to get pregnant if you have significant adenomyosis. And second, you're going to do suppression, hormonal suppression, prior to the next transfer. And you got to do a transfer, either a natural transfer or a transfer with letrozole, which suppresses estrogen, to get your best possible opportunity to implantation. All right. Again, thank you a lot. And actually, uh, we have a follow-up here. So if you could take a look from your experience, how common is endomyosis for someone in their mid-30s along with endometriosis? There's... Um... There's plenty of data that looked at the, the association of endometriosis and adenomyosis. Just like out of like memory right now, I can't find the, the actual number, but uh, there's they're, they're cousins. So they're very uh, tightly associated. And I, I want to say 30%, but it's I, I wouldn't tell you the exact number, but very, very the answer is very common. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank and, you, you know, again. obviously... Ultrasonography helps, but MRI also helps. I also want to add something else with the diagnosis of adenomyosis. You see, the advantage you have when you have me here is, is I know a little bit of something about everything because I'm a surgeon, I know immunology, I know IVF. So I get a global picture. Sometimes people don't get this global picture. One of the things about adenomyosis is that when the radiologists who read your MRI, some of them are old school. They don't know the, the modern way to look at it. They're just looking at the junctional zone, which is that sort of, it's like the zone by the endometrium, you know, and, and really close to the endometrium. We don't look at that anymore. There can be islands of adenomyosis. So you could have a normal junctional zone, which is what they measure, but then have islands of adenomyosis. And I see that all the time. I review all of my MRIs and I see tons of adenomyosis that was missed by radiologists. It's crazy. We're ready for the next question. All right. Again, thank you so much for that one. Um, okay, let's have a look at the next question. So even after endometrioma removal, from what I understand, it can reappear in a few cases. Would you recommend a successive lab up after a fairly recent one or IVF provided endometrioma is relatively small and someone had a recent excision surgery? Um, okay, so... Um, uh, this looks like somebody from Finland looking at the name. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not Finland. Looks like a Finnish name. But um, uh, here's the deal. The endometrioma is a manifestation of endometriosis in the pelvis because endometriomas, the way endometriomas happen, uh, and this has been clearly demonstrated over and over, is that you have your ovulation, the egg pops out, there's a little bit of a breach inside the ovary that has just ovulated. There's endometriosis in the pelvis because that's where endometriosis lives. Endometriosis is not endometrial tissue, by the way, and is not caused by retrograde menstruation. Okay? It's tissue that resembles the endometrium, but it's, it, it is not endometrium. It does not come from reverse menstruation. It comes from... Uh, uh, cells that are there from the uh, uh, from the early early stages of the embryo development, and they grow progressively over time. So it's sitting in the pelvis, and it climbs into the ovary. So what usually, when, whenever you have a recurrence of an endometrioma very soon after the surgery, there's two possibilities. One is that a little bit of the endometrioma was left behind, which is a possibility. And you can't really blame the doctor in a sense that the doctor maybe tried to be conservative on the ovary, not to break, to rip it and all that stuff. And the second one is that endometriosis was left in the pelvis. So the instant you drop the ovary back in, you take out the endometrioma, you drop it in, you got a raw surface, whatever endometriosis is under, it climbs right back in, and there you have it. You have endometriosis again. So do I recommend a new lap after a fairly recent one or IVF provided endometrioma is relatively more? I mean, I think that it depends on your age or the age of the person, but I would probably tell the person, do an IVF cycle and bank those embryos. See how many you have and then make a decision on what to do.
you know, that's what I would recommend. But at this point, I think I wouldn't recommend another surgery right away. Get some embryos out, make some embryos, bank them, and then figure it out. I know these can be problems in Europe where they, they don't like embryo banking, they don't like PGI. There's all sorts of rules everywhere. So, uh, you know, maybe it may not be feasible. I'm just talking in terms of, in terms of generic terms, yeah. All right, of course, again, thank you Generalized. for that. Um, and actually, there will be a question about supplements. I'm sure that you uh, receive that quite a lot, quite often. Mm -hmm. So is there any supplements that is proven to help endometriosis and adenomyosis? I hear about NAC and serapaptase. And yeah. can ubiquinol, this is another one uh, mm -hmm. in this part of, so 600 uh, yeah. micrograms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's just, ubiquinol, the whole idea about behind ubiquinol is that um, ubiquinol uh, basically is CoQ10, right? It's a form of CoQ10. Uh, and uh, the whole idea behind ubiquinol is that part of the lecture that I did earlier, you saw that I said that eggs have lower uh, mitochondrial content. So the whole idea is that uh, by uh, supplementing uh, mitochondria, you're increasing a, 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 the egg energetic component. Uh, you know the mitochondria are like the engine of the of the of the cells, so that's one of the reasons. Um, in terms of other supplements, uh, neck is a possibility, mostly on the pain side. Though, what I would probably suggest is to consider um, any sort of anything that's kind of like lowers inflammation, uh, and you could consider. Um, I I like personally. Um, um, a uh, tree bark, it's also called pycnogenol. And uh, I like, um, uh, I like uh, curcumin. I like um, um, melatonin. So those are kind of the elements that are key there. Yep. All right. Once again, thank you so much for yet another advice. And, um, and also like, you know, if you're going to use, if you're going to take one supplement that I think helps infertility, in my opinion, the one supplement should be fish oil. All right. Just because it's both a blood thinner and, uh, and an inflammation reducer. So, you know, if you're going to take one, I, I don't like it when people come with a list like this long of, 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 of all these supplements, because I kind of feel that sometimes they fight against each other. So if I, if, if, if I should recommend one or two, I guess I would recommend vitamin D3, which we know is affects also low vitamin D3 affects also, uh, miscarriage. So I would say I would seriously consider taking at least 5,000 a day of vitamin D3, 5,000. 5, and I would certainly consider taking at least 2,000 of fish oil, fish oil. Excellent. Thank you so much indeed. And actually, next one is a um, short question. Um, so what is the youngest age to start treating endometriosis? That's a very good question because, uh, and I think Dr. Sally Sorrell could have a lot to say about that. And we do have uh, on our Endometriosis Summit uh, website and on our page, uh, I think we have one. Sally, correct me. I think we have one on adolescent, right? Don't we have one on adolescent endometriosis on our YouTube page, Endometriosis Summit? Look it up either on YouTube or on uh, Facebook. You can find, if you search Endometriosis Summit, you'll see that we have a whole thing about that. But, you know, endometriosis uh, is a disease which is, uh, it's not as progressive as some think it, it is, but it certainly progresses from the adolescent ages to adulthood. And those key, those key uh, years are crucial in the development of endometriosis, okay? So uh, our perspective, my perspective as a physician, but also the perspective of the Endometriosis Summit as an organization is that, Endometriosis should be treated whenever it presents, if, of course, the symptoms are severe enough. And uh, so I feel that uh, it's essential to uh, treat it the sooner the better. We treat adolescents, we treat, uh, you know, young teens. So uh, that's the answer that uh, because the more you wait, the more you develop chronic problems. And, and uh, there's a chance to actually have a very different outcome in life if it gets treated early enough. That was a great question. Thank you, Ofra.
Thank you indeed, of course, for that uh, question. Um, okay, and now let me go uh, back to the previous uh, question. Okay, it is a bit longer one. So I was only diagnosed with endometriosis three months ago. Previously, we have failed to make quality embryos, only making poor average day three, all of which failed to implant. We are ready to give up and move on to donor eggs. Is there any hope after getting endometriosis removed that we might conceive with my own eggs? I'm 40. We have been trying for three years with IVF without success. A laparoscopy is not available to me for another 14 months due to wait list. Well, this is a very weird question, right? Because there's a lot of parts in it. Um, you have a... Um, you know, you have a, a high likelihood of endometriosis with the receptiva. Uh, you have an egg quality problem. And, uh, um, and your issue is that you are older. Not too old, but older. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the access to a laparoscopy because of where you live, whether it's the UK or Canada or uh, anywhere else in Europe, but, you know, I would say the worst offenders are the UK and Canada, in my mind. Um, uh, then you have to wait a long time to get your surgery. And uh, you're asking me, is it worth it? I mean, this is a very difficult question for me because obviously um, I, I can't comment on what's worth or not worth because that's a personal decision for you to decide. What I think is that uh, in my mind, egg donation, you could do it later. There's no pressure for, for, uh, for egg donation, you know, because you could do that the same, it would have the same similar outcome at 41 as at 43. So in, in my experience, uh, um, egg donation is, you know, can, you can access it later. So I would say uh, my advice to you would be try to get the surgery earlier, maybe go to another province uh, the advantage in Canada, you could go to different provinces, and if you push hard enough, maybe you could get your laparoscopy in. Thank you. All right. Thank you indeed, of course, for uh, yet another advice. Um, okay, next question is up right here. So do you recommend doing IVF stimulation prior to endometriosis excision surgery or after? I was told that IVF stimulation aggregates, sorry, or worsen endometriosis. Leilani, a uh, very good question. Um, it's a question that doesn't have an automatic answer because it depends on one's history. It depends on um, how severe the endometriosis is. It depends on uh, um, your age. So in order to give a, there isn't like a solution for everybody. So, but I'm gonna try to sort of sum it up somehow. Um, if you have, very extensive endometriosis and an endometrioma, I would recommend excising the endometriosis first because if you have all those endometriomas, it's going to be a mess. You're not going to get a good result, okay? Uh, and uh, it is true that endometrioma, endom that the stimulation will make the endometriosis worse for sure. If you have done cycles before and poor egg quality, obviously, you know, go ahead and have the surgery. It makes no sense. If you have mild to minimal endometriosis and you and the doctor says, well, let's, let's bank some eggs first and then you'll do the surgery and then you'll do the transfer, that's also an option. So I would say severe extensive disease surgery first, uh, just because you're not going to have a good cycle. Uh, if you have like milder disease, you know, the decision is based on your age. Excellent. Again, thank you so much for yet another one. Okay, um, let's have a look, okay, at the um, next question. So, I went through seven cycles, has had 12 times embryo transfer, only two miscarriage. The country I live, they don't do PGD test. I'm 43, tried more than five years. The doctor can't find a reason. And here they don't do any extra tests. I have AMH at uh, 1.24. They have any chance to get pregnant with my own? eggs yeah Sorry. it's a, it's a good question obviously you've been through a lot believe believe me i see people here have done 25 cycles you, you're not even you're not even close to being the worst that i've ever seen but these are not the olympics of suffering so you know kudos to you to having endured such a tough seven cycles uh without unfortunately any good result you're asking me a possibilistic questions 
And possibilistic questions are anything is possible. So I can't really tell you. you when you're asking me, is it possible? The answer is that is possible. You have a good AMH, right? 1.24, which is a good value. And your question is, what do I do? Do I go with donor eggs or do I go f or do I keep on trying? I, I can't really answer that question for you, but I think that um, you're getting close to where probably using an egg donor, if available to you, is a reasonable option. It's not really endometriosis related, but, you know, definitely that's what it is. All right. Amazing. Again, thank you so much for that uh, one again. Um, okay. And Daniel has added, uh, if I have had four long protocols, IVF, three fresh, one frozen, limited egg numbers, but two pregnancies ended in miscarriage before 12 weeks, might endometriosis diagnosed some years ago, should I keep doing IVF? I'm 42. Um, well, you know, one of the things to consider uh, is that the possibility that you have an immunological problem, autoimmune problem. Uh, what I think is, um, is that you probably should consider having some sort of an immune evaluation. Uh, the other part of it is that the fresh transfers uh, can always be problematic. I would always try to go with... Uh, uh, the frozen cycle. I, I can't. I, I wouldn't tell you to give up. I mean, if you if you have a new, I would tell you to try with an old freeze and uh, maybe some immune support. You know, whether it's blood thinners. I mean, like I said, we're we're gonna come out with our immune panel soon. But I think that uh, certainly an immune evaluation may be worth it, given the the losses and uh, you know the four pro, the four IVFs. All right, again, thank you again. And um, let's have a look at the, this one, okay? So are there any particular medication you would recommend and alongside a donor egg cycle in a patient with endometriosis, like intralipis, antibiotics, etc.? Well, this is the area where we discussed um, the fact that, um, I mean, I don't know uh, if you had a failure already or if you're just concerned and you want to optimize your cycle. When you're looking at donor eggs, I always tell people, it depends on how you arrived at donor eggs. If you arrived at donor eggs because of purely age, that's something. If you arrived at donor eggs because of pure of failed cycles, miscarriages, all the other stuff, it's a separate story. So what my opinion is that the verdict is a little bit out with donor eggs and endometriosis. It's not out. You know, you can, I told you those two studies, the one from Carlos Simone and the other one. And um, so chances are, depending on your age, that you may not need a lot of support. So that would be the standard fertility doctor question. But if you had a lot of miscarriages and, you know, and um, I, the, the, I need more information. But in general, you know, if you're the general person, I would go with that with that. All uh, right, again, thank you so much for that. Okay, um, sorry, let's go to the next question. Somebody we mentioned about, sorry, Clexane. I mean, I see that Danielle's like putting a lot of questions there. Okay, well, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, let me go to the next one, okay? And we can go back to the, mm -hmm. okay, let's go ahead with this one. So what should we consider when deciding whether to use loop prone after egg banking to prep Pre prepare uterus and body before a transfer IVF if a patient has had depression in the past should lup lupron be avoided yeah you know we have to separate the use of uh, GnRH uh, um, agonists or antagonists in the context of suppression of pain where they're completely worthless uh, lupron or Elisa all these drugs we never use them uh, or we almost never use it, I should say. I should never, nothing is ever never, but we certainly do not recommend them. And within the context of IVF trials, um, uh, I can tell you that there, there's limited data on the use of, you know, ovarian suppression. And the reason for that is to reprogram the uterus, right? To reprogram the uterus because of, of, the, of, uh, of resistance, progesterone resistance. You know, the, the, the issue that I have with the Lupron is that, okay, you do the retrieval, you know, the, you, you, that's like a month. Then you do three months of Lubron, that's another three months. And then you do the transfer, that's another month. If you're not successful, you wasted six months. Maybe you're older 
and 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 you just wasted six months to just put yourself on Lupron, where your ovaries may not even ba bounce back. To me, it's not the smartest idea. I'll be totally honest with you. Uh, but you know, like I said, everything depends on your on your age and all other factors. But so the answers are very general. Okay, I have to under, you have to understand that everybody, and certainly if you had a history of depression. So it's quite possible that lupro could affect you psychologically. Why not do like a couple of months of progestins? You know, it would be an ever a similar a similar effect on the lining. All right, thank you. And yes, now let me go to the question from Danielle. Okay, you've seen that, of course, like plexane injection, yeah, no benefit yeah. notice, frozen embryo transfer fate. What immunological test would you suggest as my clinic does not want to do this, so would have to seek alternative? Yeah, Danielle, depending on where you are, and I saw you asked, you know, I don't know if it's the same, Danielle, but a lot of very pointed questions and uh, uh, smart question. Obviously, Danielle's done a lot of research. Um, a proper uh, immunological test, and we could have a whole thing on reproductive immunology, which could be extremely in interesting, but needs to look at different factors. You need to look first at compatibility between the couple. You know, they need to look at HLA and see how uh, the different HLAs, the major histocompatibility compatibility complexes of the two couples relate to each other. So we have to look at that. Um, and make sure that there's no HLA mismatches and uh, and uh, and things like that. You have to look at serology. We have to look at the presence of any sort of like any sort of uh, uh, autoantibodies, like antiphospholipid antibodies, antinuclear antibodies, um, uh, rheumatoid factors. You know, it's like a whole number of autoantibodies uh, and sort of associated with autoimmunity, and uh, as well as other sort of cellular factors associated with inflammation. Elevation is natural killer cells is one of them. Natural, K, natural killer cell activity and Th1, Th2 ratios. Those are like uh, T helper cells that play a role. So it's like a whole, there's a panel that your doctor can order. In most countries, doctors are able to order these tests. But Clexan, which is a blood thinner, that's like heparin, or Lovenox, you know, there's a, those are blood thinners that um, may help, but use like this empirically, you know, if it works, you don't know that it worked because of that. And if it doesn't work, you don't know why it didn't work. So it's one of those things. I think we're running towards a closing last question. Yep, exactly. You better be a good one. All right. Um, let me go straight to the next one then. Okay. I guess we can have a look at this one. So can multiple IVF cycles aggravate hormonal imbalance, increase the risk of recurring endometriosis flare up or breast ovarian cancer for people who are sensitive to estrogen or have family, hi family history? Sorry. Uh, when it comes to breast or ovarian, I think the evidence is pretty clear that, clear that it does not uh, increase the chance of recurrence or new or newly or, or increase the ch risk of having a cancer. Uh, um, when it comes to end of flare, for sure, a hundred percent. It's pretty clear. I've seen so many uh, individuals who, for example, uh, were completely fine. Maybe they knew that mild endometriosis. They went to do an IVF cycle, and then after that, they developed severe pain. It became symptomatic. Asymptomatic endometriosis became symptomatic. I see this all the time. So yes, you cannot ignore that. And uh, and uh, but you know, the question is that you have to be on top of it. You have to communicate with your doctors. You're sort of responsible in a way to communicate with your doctors and tell them, look, I have endometriosis. You know, these protocols can affect me, and so that's how you have to present it, basically. All right. Excellent. Okay. Thank so you let me just so say much. Before, before we close it. Sure. sure. So endometriosis at endometriosis underscore surgeon. Uh, you can also find the endometriosis summit uh, uh, also on, on Instagram and Sally may type it up there. I, I don't remember what our handle, I think it's the endometriosis summit. There you go. Um, and uh, we're also on Facebook and you can just look up my name, Dr. Andre Vidali and the endometriosis summit also on Facebook. Um, there's tons of information there as well. You'll also be able to find this um, and, and uh, this similar topics uh, there. You'll also be able to check out my website, preventmiscarriage.com. 
uh, where there's a ton of information about immunology. And we could have another one on immunology. And I think you're going to love it if you go to that website because there's so much great information. Um, there's a million ways to reach me. So, you know, and I'm sure you'll be able to do that. Or Dr. Sorrell as well. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Car uh, uh, Carolina or yeah. Caroline for being such a wonderful host. I know that I I made you sweat because I didn't call you until the last minute, but you know, I do apologize. <laughs> I hope I did okay. And I yes. hope you guys had at least some of your questions addressed. Uh, if you liked it, let them know and we'll do another one of these. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Vidali. It's been a pleasure and it's been a great, great session. Thank you so much, Sally, also for your support. And uh, well, everyone have a lovely uh, evening or day, wherever you are, of course. And um, I just want to mention that this was recorded. So, of course, you will be able to find this recording tomorrow on our website, but also on our YouTube channel. So go ahead and do it. And uh, Dr. Vidal, you can see thank yous coming up your way. So... Thank you from Thanks, guys. Uh, Thank you from very us. Much. I hope I did okay. Thank you. I Thank hope you I, so yeah. much. It's been great okay. bye to bye. have you here indeed. Bye bye. Thank you. Take bye. care, everyone. Bye. bye.